everyone. My name is Grace Akan, and I'm here to welcome and thank you all for attending. We are gathered here today in response to the United States Supreme Court's decision to overturn nearly 50 years of protections afforded to those who become pregnant, uh, thereby betraying half the country in the process. In a 6-3 decision, the SCOTUS, or excuse me, the Supreme Court of the United States reversed and remanded uh, Dobbs v. Jackson that called into question the constitutional right to abortion. The majority cited that the constitution does not confer a right to abortion and that Roe was egregiously wrong and on a collision course with the constitution from the day it was decided, end quote. The opinion is full of gut-wrenching assertions regarding individual rights. Justice Thomas, in a concurrence with the majority, makes unnerving assertions regarding the 14th Amendment and substantive due process, citing in pertinent part that the court should re reconsider all, this, uh, all of this court's substantive due process precedents, including Griswold, Lawrence, and Overfeld, cases that established married couples' right to access contra contraceptives, right to marital privacy, and same-sex marriage. The dissent, which was Justice Breyer, Justice Sotomayor, and Justice Elena Kagan, noted that in Roe and Casey, the government re recognized that it could not control a woman's body or the course of uh, a woman's life, notably stating that, quote, respecting a woman as an auton autonomous being and granting her full equality meant giving her substantial choice over this most personal and most consequential of all life decisions. The dissent asserts that the court has discarded that balance and determined that, quote, from the very moment of fertilization, a woman has no rights to speak of. Though having a choice does not ultimately guarantee access to resources made available by having that choice, taking away the choice entirely is the ultimate abuse of power in the most egregious and disgusting sense. We are uh, here today with Amplify Georgia and partners. Our list of speakers is as follows. Allison Kaufman, with the who is the Executive Director of Amplify Georgia. Kwajalein Jackson, Executive Director of Feminist Women's Health Center. Oriaku Njoku, co-founder and executive director of Access Reproductive Care Southeast. Dr. Sarah Redd, PhD, uh, Center for, from the Center for Reproductive Health Research in the, in the Southeast, that is RISE at Emory University. Tony Watkins, uh, voter, red, edu, excuse me, voter Engagement Director at URGE, uh, which is Unite for Reproductive and Gender e Equity. Malika Redman, CEO and co-founder of Women Engaged. Jasmine Keith. Uh, reproduct reproductive Justice Lead Organizer at New Georgia Project, Emily, uh, a Community Organizer, Tamika English, Program Manager at Sister Love, and Sybil Miller, Director of Communications at Sister Love, Inc. We're going to start off with our uh, set of speakers, and then we will move on to a question and answer portion of this. This should uh, take about maybe 20, excuse me, 30 minutes or so to get through the speakers. And then, like I said, we'll move on to the question and answer portion, at which point press is welcome to ask questions. Um, and then, of course, following this press conference, there is an opportunity to interview any one of the speakers who is available um, today. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Allison Kaufman. Or excuse me, I'm going to first. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm going to start with Kwajalein Jackson. Thank you, Grace. My name is Kwajalein Jackson, and I'm the Executive Director at Feminist Women's Health Center. On behalf of Feminist Women's Health Center, I want to express my complete disappointment and frustration with the opinion of the Supreme Court that was made public today. Even though we have been preparing for this eventuality, it does not make it any less devastating as an independent abortion provider who has been providing compassionate care in Georgia for nearly 50 years, we intimately understand how important abortion is to our communities. We also know that abortion access has already been difficult to impossible for so many for so long. People seeking abortion in Georgia and in other parts of the South and Midwest have already faced multiple obstacles in trying to seek care, like unnecessary waiting periods, a lack of health care coverage for abortion under Medicaid or the Affordable Care Act, forced to listen to medically inaccurate scripts, all with Roe firmly in place. In addition, many of our patients are currently scrambling to afford the cost of their care, forced to take unpaid time off work, desperately 
securing childcare for the children they're already raising, trying to find reliable and safe transportation to and from their appointment and sometimes a place to stay overnight, plus money for gas, money for food. They are navigating unsupportive or sometimes unsafe families and often traveling hundreds of miles to receive the care that they need, all before the pre-viability ban that is already in place in Georgia. This opinion is making pregnancy more dangerous in this country by not only forcing unsafe and unplanned pregnancy, pregnancies to continue against one's will, but by also further criminalizing pregnancy outcomes. And I regularly fear for the safety and well being of my staff and providers who are deeply committed to this work and endure threats, harassment, and violence from white supremacist, anti abortion extremists, extremists who gather outside of our clinic daily. All of these unnecessary obstacles have been exponentially multiplied today. And we know that this will disproportionately harm Black people and other communities of color because this country and its violent institutions have consistently failed to acknowledge, address, or reckon with the harms to or the needs of Black people. We have watched them gleefully strip rights and protections from those who they have deemed both worthless and powerless, but I am here to say that we are neither. They have no idea what we are truly capable of. At Feminist Women's Health Center, like many independent abortion providers around this country, we use a reproductive justice lens to guide our approach to care. Black women develop the reproductive justice framework to speak to the lived experiences of women of color who even then did not believe that the privacy-based pro-choice movement fully captured our challenges and the opportunities we have in achieving self-determination for ourselves and our communities. In spite of this misguided decision that the Supreme Court has made, we remain undaunted. On today, abortion is still legal in Georgia. If you or someone you love currently needs an abortion, you can still get one. And Feminist Women's Health Center is still committed to providing that care. We are providing abortion care right now, just like we have over the past 46 years and just as we intend to continue. We are committed to caring for our patients, our providers, our staff and our communities because we are focused on a shared vision, compassionate, judgment-free healthcare, abortion access and bodily autonomy for all who need it. Intentionally centering the experiences of black people, indigenous people and the trans and gender non-conforming plus community. We imagine clinics and laws and communities where our decisions about our bodies, pregnancies, sexuality, family, and safety are honored, protected, and treated with dignity. And nothing will deter us from working to realize that vision, not even the Supreme Court. Because we believe that no one is free until everyone is free. And we believe that reproductive justice including unfettered abortion access is critical to our collective liberation. Thank you. With that, I'll introduce Allison Kaufman, Executive Director of Amplify Georgia. Thank you. I wanna start by acknowledging this moment as one for collective and personal care and tenderness. We have been through a lot these past few years. Now with the fall of Roe, it is important that we take a moment or many to grieve, to rage, and to feel before springing into action. Next Saturday, July 2nd, um, next Saturday, July 2nd, we will hold a ceremonial space for folks to pause, reflect, and prepare for the fight to come. Uh, you can learn more by going to tinyurl.com slash ashes of Roe to register for this event to process and grieve. Um, the overturning of Roe will have deep and difficult impacts on our state. 
Already, Brian Kemp and his attorney general will want to take the next step of asking courts to allow enforcement of HB 41, which is Georgia's six-week ban on abortion. And we can expect anti-abortion legislators to introduce even harsher laws in the upcoming legislative session. These moments also hold immense opportunity to find a new way forward. Together, moving beyond Roe, we can create the future we deserve. We're building a movement grounded in love that fights for a world where everyone can choose if, when, and how they're going to start their family. One that honors the autonomy we each have over our own bodies. No court will keep us from accessing abortion care. The power has been shifted to the state and local government, so now is the time for local organizing, policy change, and abortion funding. This is what we're doing at Amplified Georgia. We are a collaborative of many of the organizations in this room, working together to protect and expand abortion access um, in our state through local policy change, education, and culture shift work. In the wake of this decision, we are calling on the Georgia legislature to pass the Reproductive Freedom Act which would repeal existing abortion bans and restrictions and affirm our right to decide whether to continue a pregnancy or not. Locally, we're calling on the Atlanta City Council to create a city abortion fund, which would support folks to cover the cost of their abortion care. Remember, we are the majority. Over 70% of Georgians support abortion access. Our government does not yet reflect the people it represents, but when we come together, we have the power to create the world we wanna see. Abortion is still legal in Georgia. Please join us to keep it this way. Thank you. Next, Oriaku Njoku, co-founder and executive director of Access Reproductive Care Southeast. Good afternoon. ARC Southeast is a regional reproductive justice organization that based it here in Atlanta, Georgia. Our abortion fund provides abortion funding and logistical support to people seeking abortions in six states in the Southeast. Those states are Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Tennessee, which happen to be the most hostile states or some of the most hostile states um, around abortion and abortion access. At ARC Southeast, we of course did some scenario planning, trying to imagine what abortion access will look like if the Supreme Court overturns Rome. While we, are, while we were generally optimistic about getting to a future where reproductive justice is a reality for all of us in our lifetimes, to not honor the realness of this decision would be delusional. At the same time, we must acknowledge that Roe never guaranteed that abortions would be accessible. For many of the people we work with, the ability to access abortion care has already been pushed out of reach for decades. This is our daily reality. Let me give you some examples of the people we work with every day to reach care. A majority of our callers are parents, meaning barriers like childcare, time off work, transportation, lodging are all things to consider in this moment. We live in a region where over 90% of people live in a country without an abortion provider or live in a county without an abortion provider. So folks are literally crossing state county lines to access basic health care. And over 80% of our callers identify as being Black. The implications of this ruling to overturn Roe is nothing short of devastating. People will be forced to travel hundreds of miles out of state to carry abortions or to carry abortions or to have abortions or carry pregnancies against their will. Anti-abortion lawmakers are already trying to prohibit people from accessing abortion across state lines, showing there's no limit to their cruel attempts to control personal healthcare decisions. These types of laws must be stopped. Clinics in states that provide care will be overburdened as out-of-state patients search for the essential abortion services they need. The harm would fall mostly on people of color and those living in lower incomes. Access to abortion is not just about legality. It is about our dignity, our humanity, and our freedom. 
The courts and anti-abortion politicians may try to deny our freedom and create obstacles when it comes to the decisions about our health, our bodies, and our families. But there are more of us on the side of freedom and we will not stand by silently while our human right to bodily autonomy is taken away. We are in this for the long run. We will not look back and we will liberate ourselves. Our North Star is working towards our collective liberation, which means we won't stop until people are met with the support and respect by our communities, by our states, and by our country. I know it can be hard to imagine a future where reproductive justice for all is a reality. We still have to take time in this moment to unpack this decision. And in the spirit of radical imagination and radical love for our communities, dreaming of a future grounded in reforming systems rooted in white supremacy and cis heteropatriarchy are insufficient. I don't want a future catalyzed by trauma, catalyzed by fear, catalyzed by shame. I am looking forward to a future in reproductive justice where the reproductive justice values that we create on our own terms that allow us all to thrive will be the future that we're working towards. This is an incredibly unique opportunity for all of us to step out of our comfort zones, to speak up, show out, and raise a lot of hell for abortion access. We won't stop until our laws and our elected officials respect that each of us can make the decisions about pregnancy and parenting that are best for our lives. A world where we are met with love and compassion for our decisions, whether that's to end or continue a pregnancy. ARC Southeast and other abortion funds around the country will be doing everything that we can to make sure that folks in our communities still have access to abortion care, no matter what. Thank you. Next, Dr. Sarah Redd with Center for Reproductive Health Research in the Southeast, RISE at Emory. Thank you, Grace. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Sarah Redd, and I am a researcher at RISE the Center for Reproductive Health Research in the Southeast at Emory University. At RISE, we seek to improve the reproductive health and equity of people in the U.S. Southeast through transdisciplinary research that informs social systems and policy change. RISE is a home base for numerous experts in reproductive health research, including abortion access and policy. We work with our community clinic and advocacy partners to investigate the many implications of shifts in reproductive health access for the health and well being of people in the Southeast and in Georgia. There is a vast and thorough scientific evidence base examining abortion access. The science unequivocally shows that abortion is safe that having access to abortion is a fundamental part of reproductive and bodily autonomy, and that political restrictions on abortion are dangerous. Abortion bans reduce or entirely eliminate access to abortion, increase the risk of adverse health outcomes, including infant and maternal mortality, and disproportionately impact those with the least amount of power in our society, including black people and other people of color, young people, and people living on lower incomes. A recent study found that a total abortion ban in the United States would lead to a 21% increase in pregnancy-related deaths overall in the US and a 33% increase in pregnancy-related deaths among non-Hispanic Black people, which clearly demonstrates the destructive and inequitable impacts of abortion bans. The Supreme Court's decision to overturn the constitutional right to an abortion unabashedly goes against decades of rigorous science showcasing the harms of reducing abortion access. Using abortion trend data from the Georgia Department of Public Health from 2007 to 2018, we estimated that if and when HB 481 goes into effect, the percentage of abortions needed in Georgia that would become banned in our state under a six week ban is between 65 to 70%. Many of those people won't be able to travel elsewhere to receive care, 
likely resulting in many Georgians being criminalized or forced to endure an unwanted pregnancy and birth. The detrimental likely health impacts of this decision for Georgians include increases in preterm birth and low birth weight and infant and maternal mortality, again, with a disproportionate impact among black Georgians, Georgians living on lower incomes and Georgians living in rural parts of the state. As a state with one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the nation, particularly among black people, a state that lacks a single obstetrician in half of its counties and has failed to expand Medicaid, we anticipate that the Supreme Court's decision will markedly worsen Georgia's maternal health crisis. The science has spoken. Abortion is safe, abortion is healthcare, and denying abortion access has devastating consequences on the health and well being of people and their families. Removing the constitutional right to an abortion will exacerbate the mental health crisis in America, in the Southeast, and particularly in our state of Georgia. Thank you. Next, we have Tony Watkins, Voter Edu Engagement Director at URGE. Good afternoon. Today's decision marking the fall of Roe is yet another stain in the fabric of American history. It is a disgusting display of an abuse of power. As abortion access no longer has federal protection, it is young people, black people, poor people and queer people that will pay the price for what is nothing more than the latest attack on the rights of our nation and state's most vulnerable populations. We have long said that Roe is not the is not the ceiling but the floor and if this week has taught us nothing else it is that there is a relentless pillaging of the most basic rights of young people across this country the fall of Rome must embolden us to take action now. Our federal government has proven to us that they are not willing to offer us protections that should be our most basic. However, we have the power to protect ourselves. Together, we can choose the Georgia electorate to overpower lawmakers who are advocating for a six-week abortion ban as anti-abortionists fight to hoard power over our bodies, our access to vote and more, this must be our collective call to action to mobilize our communities. Our vote continues to be our strongest tool of protest. We must combine our protests in the street with those in our ballot boxes and elect representation on the state and local level that will be the stopgap in the failures of our federal government, such as today's fall of Roe. Today, abortion access is still legal in Georgia, and we will fight to not only continue to ensure that it remains legal in Georgia, but to expand access. We are hurt, we are angry, we are disappointed, and this is exactly why we are motivated, because abortion access, especially for young and Black and Brown people in Georgia, is a matter of life and death, and we will not stop fighting for our lives. To be clear to those who contributed to the fall of Roe, please know you may have won this battle today, but you will not win the war on our bodies. Thank you. Next, we have Malika Redmond, CEO and co-founder of Women Engaged. Good afternoon. I will start by saying this is nothing short of devastating. And we need to understand that as a generation that has not had a reality without a Roe v. Wade, that this is also transformative. This moment is transformative. This is an opportunity for us to be in intergenerational conversations though, and particularly for black community and black people, this day is a part of a long fight for our civil and human rights. And that for black women who lead in voter turnout, who have done the work to forward this democracy, this is particularly devastating. And I will not make light of that. 
Founded in 2014 by the late Margaret Cardwell and me, Women Engage was founded to sit at the um, intersection of access to voting rights, voting empowerment, and reproductive justice. What Margaret and I knew then, after the SCOTUS decision of Shelby v. Holder, which decided to gut the preclearance in the Voting Rights Act, we understood then that, this, that states like Georgia and others would put sweeping legislation, bills and laws to undermine what, was, what we knew was happening. That the rising electorate that was coming together, voting in the way of progress, that there was a desire to undermine that and black women were leading the way. And as we see the kinds of important moves, transformative moves to further progress in this nation, that the backlash is as severe, intentional to undermine it. We are here to say that we will not be moved. We will continue to do our work. We will continue to fight for our children for their ability to have the human rights, the civil rights that is promised, but has yet to be fulfilled. Here in the state of Georgia, we are fighting for not only the expansion of Medicaid to ensure that so many Georgians have access to affordable health care, but for our to protect our right to vote and access to the polls. This is critical. They are interconnected for black women, femmes and girls. It is critical, it is necessary. During this year, a critical election year, it is going to be very important as my colleagues have stated, that we support our communities getting out to the polls and voting. It is also critical that we hold our leadership accountable to what we need, but also the ability for our communities to thrive. With that in mind, I want to thank the Reproductive Health Collective community here in Georgia that continues to work very hard day in and day out to support um, access to abortion care and to services that don't not only impact the city of Atlanta, our entire state and those neighboring us. This will continue, this work will continue. At the same time, this is also an opportunity for more people to support our efforts, to learn about reproductive justice and the movement, and to become a part of it. Thank you. Next, we have Jasmine Keith, Reproductive Justice Lead Organizer at New Georgia Project. Hello. My name is Jasmine Keith, and I am the Reproductive Justice League organizer at New Georgia Project. Today, in the grand tradition of white supremacy and sexism that our country remains committed to, the US Supreme Court has attacked the bodies, freedoms, and lives of women and everyone who can become pregnant by overturning nearly 50 years of abortion protections. I am outraged, but I am not at least the bit surprised. As a Black woman born, raised, and residing in the South, I know firsthand what it's like to have my rights taken away from me by people who hold more systemic power than I do. I know what it's like to be disrespected, dismissed, and disregarded when trying to access quality, affordable, reproductive health care in Georgia. I am not a statistic. I am not a point on a graph or a percentage in a study. I am a living, breathing human being and the issues directly affect my life and the lives of millions of other women and people who can become pregnant across our country and our state. But this is not just an abortion issue. This is a human rights issue. 
Unfortunately, in our country, a country founded on chattel slavery, a country where children are forced to watch the men, I'm sorry, the woman, a country where women are forced to watch the men who sexually assaulted them become Supreme Court justices, a country where we have to teach my black children how to not get shot by the police, it has always felt like my human rights were unlong to me. It is obvious to me that this decision is about nothing more than further controlling our bodily autonomy and our futures. These undercover politicians parading as Supreme Court justices do not care about my life, about the lives of the children I may or may not bring into this world. They care about preserving their own power, no matter the cost. They are starting with abortion access, but paving the way to demolish so many of our other rights that we have fought so hard for. The right to contraception, the right to marry the person of our choosing, regardless of their sex, gender, or race. Not to mention, it's also giving more power to the state governments that are hell-bent on attacking trans kids and their families, erasing Black people away from our children's education and destroying our right to vote. I want to be clear. I want to be very clear in this moment that abortion care is health care. With this ruling, we in Georgia will face so many more obstacles to ass assessing the essential health care that we need, including the dangerous prospect of being forced to give birth in a state that has the second highest maternal maternity, mater, 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 I'm sorry, the second maternal, mater, I'm sorry, mortality rate in the country. But we must remember that this is an election year and 92% of black women in Georgia support reproductive freedoms. So you best believe that come November, we will make sure that every voter in Georgia knows who is responsible for killing their loved ones. Thank you. Next, we have Emily C, community organizer. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily C. My pronouns are she, her, Aya, and um, I'm here to share my abortion story. I first want to start off with letting folks know who have had an abortion that I love you and I see you. Um, to folks having an abortion today, I'm sending you a large virtual hug and all my love. I had an abortion in April 2018. At the time, I was a college student in the middle of my junior year, and I was not ready to become a parent. I attended college in Macon, and I still live here. Macon has zero abortion providers, and the area I live in is riddled with anti-abortion pregnancy centers that disguise themselves as, as clinics. The closest clinic is in Atlanta. Um, I had my abortion in Feminist Women's Health Center. Um, abortion is often not covered by most insurances unless the pregnancy endangers the pregnant parent. Anti-abortion protesters harass clinics and hold disgusting signs to intimidate patients, and I experienced that the day of my abortion. Um, these are just a couple ways that abortion is made inaccessible to people of lower income and people living in rural areas. In 2018, I was earning $7.25 an hour um, as a work-study <laughs> uh, office assistant, and um, the most I ever earned was $121 after two weeks of work. My fiance, who is now my husband, had a, a really old car that would always break down. And our hope was that that car would be able to get us from Macon to Georgia. That's like about an hour and a half drive. We crossed our fingers that we could make it to our, to our appointment. Um, and although I had Medicaid, I knew it would not cover my insurance, cover my abortion, I mean. The Hyde Amendment pro prohibits Medicaid from covering abortions unless the pregnant person's health is at risk or the pregnancy is the result of a rape or incest. Neither of those cases apply to me. An abortion would have cost around 400 something dollars and I barely had enough money to cover meals outside of my college meal plan. I'm lucky that my fiance had savings um, from when he was earning money in basic military training that we were able to afford both my abortion and later our apartment moving cost that would be a month right after the abortion. All we hoped that was that everything would return back to normal. And thankfully we arrived early. We left Macon around six o'clock in the morning. We arrived around eight and we were just in time for my appointment. 
And what we really cared about was just getting there. We didn't even care if we could make it home. We just wanted to have the abortion. And it was a great weight lifted off my shoulders once I knew that I was no longer pregnant. I was able to attend classes and work without worrying about fatigue or cramping pains or simply just missing out. A week later, we got married and we've been married for four years. And I was able to be the first in my family to graduate college. And thanks to my abortion, things went better than normal. My abortion made my life so much better um, and allowed me to have experiences that are like as hard as accepting an MS diagnosis without worrying about being a parent at the same time. While I could exercise my right to an abortion, I clearly faced obstacles that should not exist. Abortion rights are nothing without access. Folks living outside of Atlanta deserve comprehensive reproductive health care that include abortion. Our zip code, gender, and economic status should not block a basic human right. The Supreme Court will not stop abortion. Independent abortion clinics, abortion funds, and our community will carry on. Thank you so much. Next, Tamika English, Program Manager at Sister Love. Hello, everyone. I am here to, to share my abortion story. I was 16 years old. I was in high school. I had a lot going. I was on the honor roll and I was involved in extracurricular activities. I had a semester lined up to study abroad and I became pregnant. And it was devastating for me as a 16 year old. I took the time that was necessary to get the courage to tell my mother. And when I did, we both agreed that we weren't ready. I wasn't ready to be a mom. She wasn't ready uh, you know, to see me be a mom. And we both decided that an abortion was the best course of action. We were able to access the abortion care we needed I believe we made that appointment on a for Friday, um, and I was back in school by the next Tuesday. I graduated high school with honors. I definitely had that study abroad experience. I went on to college, and I lived a beautiful life as a, as a young person. I am now the mother of a 14-year-old. That was 24 years ago, and the reason that that story is so relevant is because I am very, very concerned about what my daughter's future looks like. And I don't mean way down the line, I mean her tomorrow future. I'm very, very clear, you know, that making abortions illegal won't make them go away. It'll just make them unsafe. And that makes me extremely concerned for my daughter, for her peers, and, and for the youth in general. As a program lead on source leadership where we were one of our focus groups are youth. We, well, one of our focus groups is youth. We are very, very concerned and we are mobilizing youth as we speak. Even those that aren't old enough to vote because this is relevant for them too. So relevant and so we believe that their voices should be amplified, that they should be supported and educated um, and given the resources to, be, to, to become leaders and advocates for themselves because they're gonna need it in this environment. It's devastating on so many levels, but we are ready for this fight because we've been preparing for it for a long time. And I am more than willing to share this story wherever I need to share it in terms of my personal abortion story because it matters to me more that this right is, is implemented and codified for the rest of eternity. It matters to, that matters to me more than my privacy or any of the stigma around abortion. Abortion care is absolutely health care. Abortion rights are absolutely human rights. And that's why I'm sharing my story today. Thank you. Next we have, and finally, we have Sybil Miller, Director of Communications at Sister Love Inc. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to say first to my colleagues, my co-warriors on this call, that I uh, will say nothing more than what you have already eloquently expressed, and I'm happy to be your sister in this fight. Today, the Supreme Court made a decision to extinguish constitutional guarantee 
to obtaining legal abortions. By choosing to overturn the legal precedent, there is a lasting impact on the human and civil rights of women and birthing people. Before this leak, we knew we were on a downward spiral in terms of reproductive rights, gender oppression, the protection of women's rights, our bodily autonomy and legal access to abortion, particularly for women of color, black women and brown women, existing governing structures have not existed to protect our rights nor our autonomy. We are constantly fighting against a host of isms, not limited to sexism, racism, imperialism. And this decision today is just another example of the ongoing violence against black bodies. Without abortion access, many lives will be devastated. Overturning Roe has put our reproductive health rights and safety in even greater danger. This country is not ready for the public health impact and damage that the court has done today. Not just to the pregnant person and birthing person, but their families and their communities, and quite frankly, to the dem democracy of this country. For 33 years, Sister Love has fought for sexual reproductive justice in Atlanta. And on this day, this particular day, more than ever, we at Sister Love stand in support and in solidarity with women and girls in terms of their bodily autonomy and their human right to determine their families. We will continue to fight for a future in which we are fully liberated. And until reproductive justice is law of the land, Echoing many of you, abortion care is health care. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers. And I want to take it over to our Q&A portion. So at this time, if we have any media with follow-up questions, I'm gonna ask if you could just either raise your hand or maybe put a note in the chat that you wanna be called on and I'll call on you. This is a quiet group. Okay, uh, okay, I have Anoa Changa from News One. Um, greetings, y'all, and thank you so much, uh, Rula, for making sure I got the invite to this conversation. I really do appreciate everyone's work, and um, I know folks are holding a lot today. But my question just has to be, and I, there's so many amazing people on the call, I'm not exactly sure who to direct it to, but I just did want to just, um, in terms of the status here in Georgia, and particularly Black and Brown communities here, what, what if, if there are like three things that people absolutely need to know today, what would those th three things be after today's ruling? I'm going to give this to uh, Oriaku. <laughs> I felt it in my bones. Um, so I think a few things that people need to know is in Georgia, abortion is still legal. You can still get an abortion for to up to 20 weeks. Um, there are abortion funds like ARC Southeast, who will still help provide abortion funding and logistical support for Georgians, no matter where they have to go for their abortions. Um, I will pass it to Allison because I'm pretty sure she has some more details as well. Um, I think the other message I would have is like, we have a plan. Um, the reproductive justice organizations in Georgia have been doing this work for decades. We are prepared for this moment. And so what we ask you in this time is to join us in the work that can look like donating, that can look like volunteering, 
Mm -hmm. Um, It can look like resource redistribution. But I think if you leave with one thing besides abortion is still legal is join us. Um, Now is the time to take action. Someone you love will need an abortion. And so join us. Thank you. And I'll just add that, you know, to remember that it is also an important election year. Um, And we are, you know, um, for the state of Georgia. So make sure to participate, find out what's going on, learn more about, you know, all of the candidates. Um, And if you're in need of support with putting together a a voting plan, um, you can always reach out to Women Engaged at womenengaged.org. We can support you with that. Um, But yes, that we do have uh, agency even in this moment um, and that we shouldn't forget about that. We have a question in the chat from Ross Williams and I'm gonna direct this to Tangie Bush. Can you, can anyone speak or can you speak to the expected timeframe? When do you expect the 11th circuit to make a decision and how long will current providers be able to provide abortions after that? Um, so I think this is a two part question. And like I said, I'm gonna ask Tangie to speak to the legal analysis and then I will follow up with um, one of our, uh, whoever wants to speak as a, an abortion provider. Okay, oh, thank you, Grace. I am traveling, so forgive the background noise. Um, as far as how long it will take the 11th Circuit to make a decision, considering that the oral arguments on Sister Song v. Kemp were heard in September 2021, there's nothing to state that there has not been an opinion written up already. It simply would need to be filed. There's nothing necessarily additionally that has to happen prior to um, the 11th Circuit making a decision on that because they've already heard the arguments, reviewed the briefs, et cetera. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it will be immediately. It does not necessarily mean it'll be tomorrow. It doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be a month from now, but there's nothing to stop them at this point because all they did was put a stay on the injunction um, or a stay on the case and uh, a permanent injunction on HB 41. The moment that they enter an order on that case, if it does in fact um, remove the injunction, um, an order is effective the moment that it's filed. So it'd be an instantaneous effect on, on activity in Georgia. Thank you, Tanji. And so for that second part, uh, I'm gonna give it to one of our pro- uh, abortion providers. Um, okay, I will call on Oriaku, is she still available? or uh, I don't think Kwajalein is with us. <clears throat> okay, neither one of them are with us. Um, so I'm gonna just move on to the next question and I can... Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next question. <clears throat> next question I have is from uh, Jess Mador. I hope I said that right. What is your legal strategy if the 11th Circuit allows HB 481 to take effect? Okay, Grace, I'm assu- is that for me as well? <laughs> I'm assuming that the word legal triggered it to me. Um, yes. The legal strategy, so, so a few things. There are a few things that can happen because obviously House Bill 481 came into effect in 2019. So at this point, it would be a mobilized effort, right? We either need to meet them at the polls. Um, Two things, you can vote because you are directly affected by the people that are in the legislature. And this is a direct effect of that. Um, And beyond that, I'm assuming that an additional fight will keep happening. I'm not personally involved in the Sister Song case. So there's always somebody to check homework after the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and that's just a phrase used within the legal system that they still could appeal beyond that, depending. I, I, again, I'm not sure exactly what their strategy is, but I know what we can do on the ground um, from a legal standpoint. Thank you, Tanji. I see Oriaku is available and I'm gonna kick it over to her on um, giving us a, an estimate of, or excuse me, a rundown for um, how long current providers will be able to provide abortions after the 11th Circuit make a, makes a decision. 
Yeah, I'll just go ahead and say that um, ARC Southeast wasn't part of the HB 481 um, case that was introduced. So, um, and I'm not a lawyer, so I don't have a lot of intimate knowledge on when um, any of this could happen. But as Tanji was saying, once the um, an order is presented or uh, submitted, that's when we can expect um, some more information on HB 481. Thank you, Oriaku. I want to just actually ask this question from Alessandro Sassoon at State Affairs more broadly, since we've had a lot of questions about the legal analysis. Um, what are the remedies at the state level um, following this decision? So the remedies at the state level, unfortunately, given that it's already a bill that was enacted essentially and then had to be uh, placed under injunction, are past new legislation, obviously, but then we have to get to um, we have to get to that point, right? Um, other than that, there can be others who challenge um, HB four eighty one once if it is put back into effect. There are a few different ways to tackle it immediately and in the long term. So I think that the immediate would be others challenging those the, the bill. Thank you, Tanji. What about um, uh, remedies that are non-legal at the state level? And I think Allison is going to be the one to respond to this. Yeah, I was gonna add um, a few notes. So one thing is contesting HB 41. Another is introducing our own legislation, right? So we are calling on a Reproductive Freedom Act to be introduced at the upcoming legislative session, which would repeal all existing um, abortion restrictions and bans and affirm folks' rights to make a decision to continue or terminate their pregnancy. Um, we don't need to be limited by what they are proposing. You know, we, this is our moment for vision forward, audacious bills um, to create the futures we want. I also wanna note that there is a role of local government in safeguarding access. Here in Atlanta, um, Atlanta city government is calling on the creation of an abortion fund. Um, the mayor just released a statement and the city council has shown their support for the creation of a city funded um, fund, which would be distributed through Access Reproductive Care Southeast. Um, when we're talking about real material change, this is how local governments can impact access by supporting folks to cover the cost of their care and the cost of accessing care, whether they're accessing it in Georgia or they have to travel out of state for this care. And this is what um, brings us back to the importance of voting. And um, because in the state of Georgia, we will need to have important change in our statewide um, government. We need to have new kind of leadership that is going to support the kinds of bills and um, suggested legislation that we are proposing. Um, we need people who will support it, who's going to champion it. Um, we know we have local support here in the city of Atlanta that understands um, why it is critical to have access to abortion and reproductive health care. We need this to be understood statewide. Um, and so this is why it's, it's, it's important not only for community members to have all of the information they need to make the kinds of decisions when they go and vote that um, are best for themselves and their families, but also for all of our um, partners that do the kind of social justice and reproductive um, justice kind of work to make sure that we are having the kinds of conversations with our community members, with our partners, with um, those that we do this work on behalf of about why it is important for them to be able to get out to vote. Um, and so this is going to be a multi-pronged strategy that has to include grassroots organizing um, that's going to have to include and, and does include grassroots organizing, um, voter engagement and access, as well as you know, continuing to ensure that we're putting the kinds of pressure on um, our public policy leaders to do the right thing locally, statewide, and also nationally.
Okay, I'm gonna ask um, lay the floor. Ask one more time if we have any further questions. Okay, so before we get into the closing, I just want to um, give Allison one more um, chance to speak. Thank you. I do want to lift up that uh, Liz Mosley has shared in the chat um, research and data if folks are interested in seeing more about that. Um, and then just to close this out, I want to say that if folks are looking at how in Georgia we are going to move beyond row and creating the futures we want for ourselves and for our families, you can go to tinyurl.com slash Georgia Repro Guide. Um, this was an existing resource which we have been collaborating on and we've added additional information on the current opportunities to mobilize across the state and um, the calls to action specific to Georgia. So again, go to tinyurl.com slash Georgia Repro Guide to find out the many different ways you can take action with us. With that, I'm going to, uh, if there are no more questions, I'm going to close this press conference out. Uh, media is invited to uh, um, join us for individual interviews with any of the speakers. Uh, following, immediately following this, I'm going to put in the chat um, a link to a Zoom for follow-up interviews. Go ahead and click on that in case you do want to shift over for an interview. And otherwise, you also have my contact information to schedule an interview separately from this. Um, you know, I'm sure we're, we're going to have a wide window following today. So um, if you don't already have my contact information, please let me know, and I will um, put that in the chat as well. Uh, thank you again to the media for joining us. Uh, we could not get this out to the general public without you. And so we ask that um, you know you just take everything here with respect for the folks who really need this information as well as the speakers who have um, put themselves out there to share this important information today. Thank you all and um, have a good one. <laughs>